many people would have seen that Simpsons episode, but let's go back in time. A group that began in California, you've been around the world. Just how proud are you of that journey of being one of the pivotal figures in hip hop? It feels great, you know. Um, it wasn't something that, uh, you know, we, we, we expected, you know, because I, I, I think as a young hip hop artist, you're just making your way and you're not uh, sort of um, absorbing the things that are happening at the time because you're on the go, 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 right? So as, as all these great things start to happen, we're not even really paying attention to that. We're just, well, this must be a part of the ride. So let's just uh, put our foot on the throttle and, and, and keep pushing forward. But when you look back, right, in retrospect, it's, it's like, wow, you know, it's surreal because you don't, as, as it's happening, you're not taking note of it. And, and when you have a chance to, to take a pause and step away from it, I think that's when I appreciate it the most. Like, damn, we've done a lot. And it wasn't anything we expected or, or you know, even sought out. We were just trying to make great music and hopefully, you know, people gravitated to it and, and connected to it in some way or another. And uh, we would never have thought, I mean, I, like not on my end, that, uh, that we would have the, the successes that, that we've had wasn't that I didn't believe in us. It's just that, you know, it's, again, we're just going, like, trying to make the music and nothing is more important than that. So, like, we're not even thinking about success or or any of that. Let's just get out there and do what we love. And so to see it all all these years later, it's 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 <laughs> it amazes me because where we started and where we came from and, and you know, it's it's just especially being from LA and the style of hip hop we do it was just not set up for us to win so for us to uh, be here these 30 years later and accomplish with the accomplishments that we've been able to uh, make happen it's it's uh, pretty goddamn satisfying <laughs> but you know we're, we're, we're really never satisfied though you know for us we always look like a, you know we got to strive for more so we don't rest on it I should say we, we now we take the time to appreciate it more than we ever used to and uh, then we just and then we push forward so um, it's it's that's always been the thing for us but like yeah it's it's been an amazing run for us something I never would have dreamed of from the 80s to the 90s those pivotal years in your group's career what was pushing you forward in terms of motivation each lyric and making you want to get more and more people to listen to Cypress Hill I think I think uh, just hip hop in general was the motivational force. Um, you know, grow, being fans of Run DMC and Public Enemy and EPMD and UTFO and you know NWA and Beasties. all of all those the Beastie Boys, all that great music that came out. And you have and you had a desire and an inner desire within yourself to to one day reach that level. You, although you don't know how you're going to get there, but that that hip hop in those years was such a vital, vital part of, of our lives that we were always trying to, you know, get to the next level to, you know, to try to see if we could actually get to where they're at. And if it wasn't for, you know, those forefathers in, in the hip hop community that laid the foundation, you know, I don't know how, how else we would have, uh, you know, achieved what we have because it was, you know, to me it was, um, Run DMC, and I had heard rap before, you know what I mean. But it wasn't until I saw them that kind of clicked in my head, like, oh, I I want to be like them, you know. So that was the definitely the the motivational force that that got me through it. And there was an air of friendly competition as well, you know. Everybody sort of it's like steel sharpening steel. You hear everybody and how dope they sound and how unique they are, and that was something that was motivating to us that we need to be that. We need to be our, our, ourselves in a unique and distinctive form that's not like anyone else. And uh, we need to sound as good as a public enemy or run DMC or any of the people that, that we grew up um, looking up to and, and inspired by. So um, it was a friendly competition in hip hop. And I think it still is. It's just, you know, changed to a different form. But uh, yeah, that's that's we were always competitive kids. He played sports. Um, I played some things, but not necessarily in school because my grades were. <laughs> but we we were all 
highly competitive kids. We, you know, like we play football, basketball against other neighborhoods. We'd get our group of guys and go challenge other guys. So in hip hop, it was the same thing. We wanted to be as good at, if not better than anyone that was doing it at the time. So, you know, it just sort of gave us that extra push forward. And the level of your music was recognized with the three Grammy nominations, but in terms of pop culture in that era, to be asked to be on The Simpsons, was that every celebrity who got that chance usually grabbed it with both arms? So when you got the call to say, we want you in an episode, how did it make you all feel? Oh, we were all excited about that, because I think we, we all understood how big The Simpsons was at the time. And, uh, you know, we jumped at the chance. It wasn't like anything we expected to happen. Um, so that that was that was a big surprise to us, but you know we jumped on the opportunity and said, "Yeah, we'll definitely do this." We didn't know what how they were going to write the script. We didn't know what it was until we got to uh, the studio, and there was no none of the other voiceover actors there um, to to give us any guidance. It was just here's the lines, read them, and uh, and that was it, you know. But it was awesome to be in their studio to see where it all had been created. Um, but we didn't know that it would take off the way that it did, that it would create this, this, um, well, it immortalized us in the Simpsons universe, right? That was one. Um, that, that, that was an honor in itself, right? Um, cause they ask you throughout your career, what, what are the biggest moments for you? Woodstock, Saturday Night Live, the Simpsons, that, you know, in that order for us, right? Um, so, you know, now to see the episode get out there and people are like, hell yeah, Cypress Hills and the Simpsons. Yeah. And then the now thing that builds after it though. Yeah. What if they got with the LSO? What would that be like? And that, that infected us, you know, Muggs, our producer was like, Hey, that might be a cool idea. And so he experimented with it for a long time and, and, you know, schedules happen and, they took us away from the idea because touring and videos and recording new music and all this other stuff sort of uh, superseded that idea, right? And, um, you know, it went away. And then it got revisited through a tweet we put out that was, you know, um, involving The Simpsons and the LSO. And LSO actually reciprocated and, and uh, re retweeted that particular clip. And then the conversation started happening there. So um, that was sort of the re-spark of us experimenting with the thought of doing this with the LSO. What can audience expect? You've got one of the oldest forms of music combining with one of the newest forms of music in something that's been shared millions of times yeah. across the internet. So many people have been waiting for this moment. Yeah, um, It's a bridge, if you will, and it's showing the adaptability of hip hop which is made from every musical form, that it could actually be recreated by the oldest form of music and put out there and a different vibe, if you will, but all organic from the ground up. And it is just such a beautiful experience, like to perform it in this way for us, you know, that we've had, we have four performances of this nature under our belt. And each time we see our fans absorb it in a different way and they all leave with, with a, a different vibe. And then we start hearing it on all our social, social networks after that, um, wherever they exist, these fans, how, how much of a great experience it was to them. Because a lot of our fans that come to our shows, um, they've been to multiple shows. We'll have people that travel, you know, following um, shows that we do, if it's a tour or if it's a festival, they'll you know, people will fly into that festival to see us. You know, we, we have well-traveled fans. And, um, you know, so it they've seen the Cypress Hill experience many times in the hip-hop form, and now they're intrigued, like, what's this going to be like? How are they going to handle this? And, I mean, we've gotten such great responses from the fans that have come seen us in the States at, at these places. And some even came from Europe to see some of these symphony shows, you know, because we'll do meet and greets at some of these shows and, you know, not necessarily the, the orchestra shows, but um, some of our, you know, hip hop 
bass shows. And those fans that have seen us dozens of times will say, hey, we went to the symphony show. That was one of the greatest shows we've seen, you know. And it, it's a trip because, I mean, you know, like we're, we're doing something very different there that's, you know, less energy driven in, in our, the physical nature of our show where, you know, we're doing our hip hop show and Sen and I are bouncing around and we're grooving <laughs> with the crowd and all of that. And this is what they're used to. But when we're with the symphony, we're a little bit more polished and, you know, it's about the music more than it is our physicality. And people still get into it. They're like loving the <laughs> So, um, it's, it's been great so far, and, and when we put uh, this show up, um, it sold out really fast. It, like, it surprised the hell out of us, because we didn't know what the reaction was. We, we've, know what it's, we, we've known what it's been in the States, and the kids there were excited for it, and our, and our old school fans were excited for it, but we did not know what, what, you know what the reaction would be here. And I believe it sold out within 20 minutes. And we were like, we were all blown away by it. We're like, what? <laughs> you know, because I mean, we do well out here, but this is a total different experience. And who knows, you know, because we were purists at one time in terms of the the style of hip hop we listened to. It, it had to be only this. Otherwise, we weren't messing with it, right? And, you know, we knew a, a lot of our fans were <laughs> the same way. Well, if it's not this raw hip hop, I don't want it. Right. And fortunately, you know, we've all grown and evolved and we listened to things that we wouldn't have listened to 20 years ago. So we're more open minded to it. And I think our, our audience, our, our fans have grown in the same way where they're open to different things now. So it, 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 it uh, was a great surprise to know that it sold out in 20 minutes and that people were like interested in, out here and in, in seeing this particular show. And to manifest the destiny of, of you know, the, the, the bridge between LSO and Cypress Hill actually happening. So, um, and the Simpsons fans that exist here, you know, so I think they, they, uh, they when they saw this go up, they're like, we got to go see this. So um, it's going to be quite a, a night. We're looking forward to it. And if we talk, you, so you spoke about the fan experience, but on stage will be yourselves in a unique setting, the Royal Albert Hall, with a unique backing team, I the LSO. What's going to go through your mind the first time that first song hits? Don't mess up. Don't mess up. <laughs> there you go. That's it. Don't mess up. Don't mess up. Don't forget nothing. Don't don't drink too much. Don't, don't smoke too much. much. You know, it, it's definitely a, a thing where, you know, the, you feel special. You, it, you, it's, it's, it's a special event. And, um, and uh, at normally, like at, a, at our one of our regular concerts, if we mess up a vocal or something, we just keep on going through it because uh, you know the music is loud and there's a lot of lyrics going on, and maybe people didn't recognize that you messed up or whatever. But in this in this such setting, I think you have to, you know, be really precise and and very very careful of what you do and what you say and how you say it because. Um, I think people could hear everything that's going on. So, just, I mean, as far as I, if I'm concerned, like um, I, I definitely want it to be one of my best performances that I that we give, um, just because of the fact of the, you know, of who we're doing it with. And every now and then, I like to turn around and look and see the instrumentation go down. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because it kind of like gives me, you know, chills, goosebumps, just to to see all those violins moving in unison and, and all that stuff and. It's, it's special that way, so, you know, don't mess up, and, but I, I don't think that we're, we're going on stage ever thinking we're going to mess up, but it happens, but I think for this stuff, for this particular show, I think we're all ready, and we know what everybody has to do, you know, we know our, ourselves what we have to do, and just go out there and, you know, complete the mission and have fun doing it. Yeah, you know, when you're up there with the best players in the world, you want to be on your best game, so I think that's, that's the thing that goes you know, as a, as a unit, because we're very competitive. You know, when we go do festivals or any shows and let's say we're not headlining, we're playing support to the headliner. We're trying to cut the headliner's head off. <laughs> so we're trying to be, you know, the best in game. So when we know we're playing with the best, we're, we're, we're trying to, you know, be on our best. Because I mean, you know, we don't, we don't want to do ourselves nor 
uh, the LSO a disservice by not coming with our best. So, you know, it, that, that's something that uh, is always on the back of our minds. And again, we never thought we'd be in a position like this to be playing with the best musicians in the world. So um, it's an honor to be playing with them. And uh, yeah, we're gonna come with we're gonna come with that uh, that certified ass kick Cypress Hill show, but with the orchestra. Word so. up. And I heard the look you have right now won't be the look you have on stage. You're gonna honor the LSO and be. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That was that was the idea coming in because I think a lot of people thought we would come in in our hip hop wardrobe and you know just do what we do but with the orchestra but we decided no we're gonna you know buy all the way into the look and and the style of doing an orchestra show i mean we know that the wu-tang did their thing and they had the hoodies on and that looked cool but we wanted to come in and uh you know just be more traditional to what what you do with a symphony and orchestra so and we didn't mind you know getting in the suits and you know doing that because i mean it's Again, it's not something that we anticipated doing ever. Like, we're going to get up there and perform in suits. I, I don't know if we'd ever do our traditional hip-hop show like that, but for this, this just seemed like we got to do it this way. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we did it that way, I mean, that was another surprise to our, our fans that have come see the other show, that we were all in in this way and um, dedicated to making this, like, something traditional but new, right? Um, and uh, it feels good, man. Feels good. Uh, yeah, I'm still getting used to the hard bottom <laughs> shoes and things, but <laughs> we're one accord. But, but it's it's it, it's a cool deal, man. It's very cool. I'm going to take you back in time because this is one of my life experiences. You played at the Milton Keynes Bowl with Eminem during the set. The um, power went out, yeah. so you had to just use your bongos yeah. and just play. And I was in the crowd. When it comes to unique situations like that where you've always had to adapt, how have you been influenced from that moment of The Simpsons where it was actually, we could give that a try and we can start bringing other things into hip hop? Yeah, that was a big moment that we realized that we could improvise and, and, and do stuff with just instrumentation as opposed to our tracks that we have, right? So um, yeah, that, that led to you know, doing stuff with a band which was um, Send Dog's influence because he was uh, doing a band called SX10 at the time. Uh, and shortly after that tour is when we start, you know, doing things with more instrumentation as opposed to just relying off a track. And, uh, you know, that let us know that we could actually do this in any form. So that little mistake sort of helped us grow. And, you know, to show that no matter what mistake might happen, we're going to keep the show rolling until it gets back on track. So, it, you know, it learned, it, it, it uh, helped us learn how to control the crowd when things go not necessarily the way you want them to go. But it also opened our eyes to, well, maybe we can, you know, get players and, and you know, replay some of the music. And that way we don't necessarily have to rely off track so much. Um, and that was before Serato and, and the DJs start actually having the instrumentals back on the turntables. This is when people are using DATs and instant replays and different playback systems um, for their tracks. So you got control, but not as much control as the DJ with the wax on there, right? So um, at that point, we were like, well, you know, maybe we should think of a different presentation of our show. And that's when we would do half of it track and half of it with band and we were going back and forth in this form but you know it all pretty much happened after that after that uh, scenario and i forgot that happened but yes that <laughs> did happen that <laughs> was crazy and salute to eminem for for um bringing us on man you know um because that that sort of opened us up back to a younger generation of of hip-hop um enthusiasts that were into Eminem specifically um, and G-Unit because it was like the ang anger management tour and they were the two groups that were popping at the time. I mean we were still doing our thing but like it just sort of put us back in the conscious of, of, of people's minds because they might have forgotten about us you know what I mean and here we go and we 
perform this dynamic set. But on that day, we didn't get to do the dynamic set. We just sort of lived and, and stuck through it. But yeah, I mean, it, it gave us the, 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 the idea that we can, we can do different things to, to make this show go forward. Like to perform a whole song with just congas without all the other bells and whistles. I mean, that, that, that opened our eyes to things because it, the, the crowd accepted that. And they, some of them didn't even know the sound went out. They thought it was a part of the show. Yeah. But you knew, and we knew. We're like, oh, <laughs> shit, the sound's gone. God, what do we do? No, that was, an, that was an epic moment. I think also in terms of the group, you're known for your advocation of cannabis. One of the parties that was won in the election also wants to legalize cannabis here. Why do you think legalization is a good thing? Well, cannabis is healing for one. We know this. Um, more studies. Uh, that have come up shown that it's helped people um, in many different aspects medically, right? And it's harmless. Um, you know, since they've uh, legalized it back in the States, in certain states, um, you know, people are, are living better lives. You know, they're not in fear of going to jail for something as harmless as cannabis. And it's also boosted our economy in certain states where, you know, we had pretty bad deficit in California and once legalization happened and the 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 tax revenue from cannabis sort of bailed us out of that crazy ass debt you know and I would imagine it's done that for other states um and and uh you know with that with that revenue we ended up in California having a surplus that we didn't have for many years since before uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger was our governor. I think during a time of Gray Davis when we were in crazy debt. So cannabis sort of, you know, uplifted the state with with uh, with revenue that it didn't have previously. And I think if if they legalized here, um, you'd see the same same action, and tourism would be crazy too because a lot of tourists come and they want to get that weed. <laughs> so if it's available to them, I mean, yeah, it's, you guys would clean up down here. No one would have to like be bringing their weed from Amsterdam down here. They get it right here, and uh, yeah, I, I think it's 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 overdue. Obviously, there's a big cannabis culture out here. A lot of advocates, a lot of activists, um, but you know, it takes the people to make it happen. You know the willingness and, and to fight for it. If, if if you don't think it's that important, it ain't gonna happen. But if you feel like this is something we need, you, you find the resiliency within you and others who feel the same way to like do something about it. So, it's great that they're having these conversations and and uh, that they're a little bit more open to it than they than they've ever been. I mean, because when you got others, other places here in Europe like Spain and Germany and you know, the rest that are now converting into the thought of we should legalize cannabis here. I mean, they're doing well with it and, and they're showing growth within that community and in and, and that industry. So I think it would be great if they legalized it here. Last question. You wouldn't have been able to predict this. Even the Simpsons wouldn't have been able to predict this. But tomorrow night when you're on stage, there will also be a pretty big football match between England and the Netherlands. Have you thought how are you going to react if there's a sudden cheer in the crowd as someone's checking their phone? We're just going to cheer with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, we, had, we had anticipated this um, from yesterday, right, when we heard that there's going to be a match at the same time. You know, um, I don't know if at the time we'll be playing if that match will still be going, but if it is and they are checking their phones, that's fine as long as they're there with us and they're absorbing this show and not too distracted. Because I know how it is, you know, I'd be at a concert and a Laker game might be on and I might be like, well, okay, what are they doing? So, you know, as a sports fan, yeah, you know, you're sort of dedicated and you might catch a glimpse here and there, but, you know, watch the show. <laughs> And finally, if you could give a message to all of the people who are lucky enough to have a ticket for your soul that show, what can they expect tomorrow night? I think I, they can expect a, a really good time and some really great musicianship and, you know, and the funky Cypress Hill shit, you know, and come, in, come out and enjoy it and, 
And like if you were at any other concert, you know. And we want to say thanks. You know, thanks <clears throat> for believing in what this is and, and being excited about it. Thank you so much for your time, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. All right.